Let's go ahead and let's get started. So, who am I? Uh, founder of Game Theory Lab. I'm also a professor of game and simulation programming. Uh, so here locally, uh, what I used to do was uh, nanoscale semiconductor growth kinetics. Uh, that's where my PhD was simulations of <coughs> that kind of stuff. I uh, worked on some other projects for Department of Defense, advanced research projects like the uh, flexible embedded electronics for the airborne laser program. And uh, I did swarm C4ISR networking control system stuff for uh, Army and this defense agency for some embedded base systems. Uh, so I took all that and then uh, kind of what I do now is building web apps. Uh, I'm looking at uh, kind of high performance applications, things that are real time, pushing the limits. Uh, cloud cluster computing, especially dynamic on the fly, being able to have cluster computing on the fly, I really kind of like that stuff. Uh, game technology, using game technology in all sorts of applications, not just making a video game, but real-time graphics are a very effective tool for uh, getting information across. And then I do uh, artificial intelligence modeling, learning algorithms, optimizations, things like that. So that's kind of my background where I'm coming from. Uh, so let's go here. So let's look at a uh, survey. So this is either going to go really well or it's going to tank. We'll see how you guys pick this up. So, so I'm going to open up this poll here. So kind of <coughs> only get an idea of where we're at with this group. So if you go and you click, go to the link uh, meetup.game3labs.com, I want to get an idea. So who in here has done matrix math or vector math? A couple. Okay. That's good. Yeah, zero responses. So okay. okay. So yeah, but as you respond, I'll hit those buttons. It'll actually. Up here. So got a couple. Of oh. Ones. Yeah, right. I'm a slow typist. So I'm in, uh, oh, okay. All right. So, well, I've got three surveys. That's okay. We'll go to the next one. So we got a All few right. people. So you know, when we're talking about 3D graphics, that's kind of the core. You've got to be able to multiply matrices or vectors together. So I'm not going to have a lot of math in here necessarily, but I'm going to show you where you need to be doing that. So who is, uh, has this experience with Canvas, either 2D or 3D? Any of those in here? Uh, so at least one person. Right, so not so effective, I'm guessing, not doing this. Again. This is HTML5 and nobody's used a Canvas? I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Uh, that's going to be the kind of the core to being able to start doing 3D graphics. You're going to have to start manipulating the Canvas object. Uh, for 3D, it's pretty simple. You've got to create it, and then uh, it gives you an OpenGL context, so that's good. And then the last one. Has anybody had any experience with uh, 3D graphics? Uh -huh. Oh, it went away. <laughs> there it goes. Yeah. What is it? I programmed it for 4D. <laughs> <laughs> so 3D graphics, so has anybody here done 3D graphics before? All right, that's, that's good. Okay, so we've got some people that are kind of love responses on that. That's good. It's working. Excellent. A couple beginners. So that's good. All right, so what I wanted to focus the class on, whenever I was here doing the multi-threading section of stuff, we talked about and I asked, do one from a beginner's level. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about WebGL, really goes back to OpenGL, but we're going to start it from the ground up. So you get the basics of 3D graphics and move into it. So hopefully by the end you at least know all the steps and the processes you need to do something with 3D. I should close the poll. All right. So we still always start off the question is, what is WebGL? And so uh, what I have here is the WebGL is nothing more than a wrapper. It wraps around OpenGL and OpenGL 2.0 ES. ES stands for the embedded system. So it is the OpenGL for mobile devices. Okay. Uh, it's, if you know OpenGL ES, especially 2.0 or OpenGL 2.1, you know WebGL. It's almost the exact same call. In fact, if you name your canvas the right thing, the only thing you have to change in all your graphics calls is add a dot. That's it. So that's great. So if you've got OpenGL experience, then you're on the track to be able to do this very quickly. Kind of the issue, though, with uh, WebGL is it's sort of like a back to the future. Okay, so OpenGL ES 2.0 was established in like 2006, I believe. So we're taking technologies seven years old, and that is now the new standard of tech 
for the web. So there's a lot of stuff that's been developed in 3D graphics, especially OpenGL, DirectX, and so forth, some advanced techniques that really make things look nice and shiny and pretty that you cannot do in WebGL. Okay, so WebGL is the old standard. Now they are working on you know, updating standards. We're at WebGL 1.0. They will get to 2.0. They will add more features and more capabilities, but you just kind of have to know that. You'll see a lot of guys who talk about it, and it's kind of like what you guys were saying before, back to 95. It's, your people are having to go back to their roots of how they optimize stuff 10 years ago to get it to look really good, and they're having to do that in WebGL because now the standard doesn't support it. You can do it on a native app, no problem. If you want to do it in the web, you've got to start looking at these optimization techniques again. Now this one's great. I got to update this slide today, so it was really awesome. WebGL, where it works. So it works out of the box in Chrome, Firefox, and Opera. Safari, it works if you put the developer tab on and then you say enable WebGL. So it's there, but it's not uh, enabled by default. Uh, IE has not supported WebGL, but has anybody seen the new releases? The people are, IE 11 was leaked and people have been looking at it and it looks like amazement that they have added WebGL to IE 11. That's huge. That was one of the biggest hurdles for moving forward is that that major browser was not supporting it. The, uh, some other issues, you know, they're a DirectX company, so supporting OpenGL and their native technology, a lot of people were just like, mm, they're not gonna ever do it. Well, it looks like they're getting on board and they're supporting the actual standards calls, not some funky MS version. <laughs> they're doing the real one, which is amazing and awesome. So, woohoo, we we may have it supported in all major browsers here pretty soon. So that's a pretty big step for us right there. Uh, WebKit, uh, yeah, uh, WebKit is at this point, you know, Fire, well, not Firefox, but uh, Safari and uh, Chrome are all built off WebKit, so it supports it. Actually, the next release of Chrome is, is blank. blank, right? Yeah, but it'll s still support. They're, they're forking WebKit, yeah, yeah. right? So since they're forking it, it'll still have all that base functionality in it. But they're going to redo the rendering engine, which I imagine is probably brought up because of the ASM.js stuff that's coming out. They're really trying to. Uh, Bringing some cool stuff with that. So yes, it is the WebKit, uh, everything there. So that's great. So that means the state of WebGL is looking good. And we're really starting to get full support across the browser, so you can expect that in the future. So why all the hype? Why is there so much people talking about WebGL? And what makes it different? Because I mean, they tried to do 3D websites in the past, so what's the difference? So the key is, is that it's GPU accelerated. So that makes it fast. Uh, everything that's done in WebGL is sent to the graphics processor. So if you've got a better graphics processor on your device, you get better performance. You start looking at mobile devices, and we're not stuck with the same, well, you might know how many cores are on the new iPad graphics processor. There's a hint. Yeah. Four. 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 Right. Yeah. That's a quad core, right? So you start looking at these multiple cores, we're really starting to amp up the capability of our mobile devices. And they're starting to get taken advantage of this. In fact, if you are not using WebGL or something like this or accelerated canvas, 3D CSS, you're actually limiting the capability of the device. The device has that process and they're going to use it. So if you don't use it, it's going to be slow. If you do use it, anybody seen the famous stuff? They talk about that. Uh, it was in San Francisco. They were releasing a 3D CSS and they were talking about how amazing it was, but it's been out for a while. People have been using it. They're just first people to market it. And, uh, you know, it's supposed to be the first truly responsive HTML5 design. It's nice and fluid, but it's just because it's using GPU acceleration is what makes it work so well. So this is something we have to kind of get on board with, realizing that now we have multi-core architecture. That's why I gave the talk last time on multi-threading. You have to start utilizing these technologies because the architecture has fundamentally changed from what it was 10 years ago. we got to start taking advantage of it. So how fast? So this was a little uh, demo I did. I'll show. Uh, I don't know if I've got sound. Oh, I do. Great. So uh, I was doing artificial intelligence, and I wanted to send all my AI calculations and do them on the GPU. So I had 350 units all being calculated on the GPU. So I'm actually doing standard calculations you just do in JavaScript, but I shipped it over to the GPU core to see just how fast I could do it. How much quicker was it? So this is, uh, I did it both in a WebGL version and an OpenGL version. But here's the... Uh, Ooh. 
this was the improvement. Okay, it was a 95 percent or 97 percent, whatever it said on the slide, a performance increase. The red is the distribution of how much time it took, how many milliseconds. So I went basically from somewhere around 55, 60 milliseconds to do the calculations to one or two, right? So you can definitely tell. Can it calculate numbers quicker? Can it crunch it faster? Yes, without a doubt. You can get a 12 times performance increase just by using GPU normally, right? That's major, especially when we're talking about speed, right? So it's definitely something we need to be looking at. Right? It really gives you a huge performance. So WebGL is awesome. It's fast. It's good stuff. So Gmail locked. All right, so now let's go to the next, just the 3D basics. We start talking about 3D graphics. What are we dealing with? All right. So here, uh, looks like I'm a little off the screen there. That's all right. Uh, you've got vertices, which are just points in space. And then those vertices get connected up to form triangles. Those triangles then form 3D objects. So here's kind of an example of the top shift here. You can see that's the, what we call the wireframe. And all the edges connect up to make triangles. And every corner of a triangle is a vert. Okay, so a vert, vertice, something like that. A lot of times you've got the triangle called a polygon too. So I can show you a quick demo here. So all my demos are going to be HTML5 driven, so everything that I do, you can definitely do on your side. And these are all <coughs> open source, you can grab anything. So let me uh, just kind of... So here's the 3D object. It's basically made up of a bunch of verts, points, creating triangles, running right here on the screen. Uh, I can go ahead and click on the rotate, spin it up, and just watch it kind of spin. So these are our 3D models. Okay. This data is usually generated in some type of 3D modeling application. You don't usually do it by hand. So 3ds Max, Maya, Lightwave, something, whatever your tool is. I am not a 3D artist, so I don't use that. They give me the model, and then I display it for them. So this is. Uh, Every model would made up of that. Right? So that's kind of a fundamental principle is the number of vertices and polys, those triangles, is how many we have to draw to the screen every update. So normally you want to keep your update rate at least 30 frames per second. A lot of people say they shoot for 60. It doesn't really matter if it's 60. You can't fall below, I believe, 27. I think 27 is the really golden number. Everybody just rounds it to 30. If it's above 30, then the user can't see the refresh rate. Okay? OpenGL is locked to the refresh rate of your screen, so it's usually 60, unless you pick that up, but it's your 60 hertz. Alright. So, uh, I had to update this slide too, because up to a couple of weeks ago, WebGL did not have any defined model format, but recently uh, the Chromis group, the people who hold the standard to keep updated with it, are adding a transfer format, and it's going to be the Collada uh, format. I don't know if it's Collada 1.5, I believe, something like that. That has actually become an ISO standard now, and so they are looking to create a new GL tag or an OpenGL uh, to send data into WebGL. So there would actually be some standardized model format that you can now use with WebGL. Up until that, you basically have to create your own loader. You have to be able to parse out their file, find the vertices, find the edges, all that, connect it all up, and create a model file that you will use inside of your WebGL engine. Uh, all the WebGL engines out there have their own built-in ones, so that's fine, but if you're trying to do it from scratch, it's not built in. You have to write it. Okay. Uh, so, Collada is a really great format, but it's huge. That's usually the problem with it. It's XML based, and we start putting animations and things in it, it's really big. But the nice thing is that you can convert these over to some proprietary format fairly easily, put in a JSON model or something that will actually load a lot quicker. And now with a binary JSON and some of the uh, binary protocols they've got, with typed arrays, you can literally send over sockets binary data, which means there's no decompression, no trying to translate it from a stream back to a number. So those are all pretty big improvements that have happened that have really dramatically decreased the loading times for this stuff. So some of the kind of common ones are going to be OBJ, uh, which is kind of your standard, but it's a non-animated format. FBX, if you're doing uh, 
Prius Max, things like that, or DAE, which is your Colada based formats. So these are all uh, <laughs> formats that you can go read types on, or you have to pick an engine that has a loader, hit the right form, and you're good to go. What these model files store is they store the relative positions of all the vertices of the model. So all the points that make up that model is stored inside of this file. Then it stores the normals for the surface. So to do the lighting calculations, you have to know what the normal surface is for every triangle. Because then we use that with the light to calculate how the shade's going to go over the surface. Uh, then it'll take the texture coordinate. So the image that you want to wrap around the 3D model, like that ship I just showed you a minute ago had a texture wrapped around it, colors and stuff, which is an image. You have to tell it the coordinate inside of the image, which is a 2D coordinate, that for every verb. Uh, the next thing is animation data, if it has it in there, and the materials which describe it, so how much it reflects, how much it absorbs light, different things like that, to give it the look of glass or the look of metal or plastic or something like that. So it's all, all of that can be done inside of a modeling software that's all stored in the file, and you have to decode that out to put it in WebGL. Long? Okay. So I built another kind of simple demo just to show off kind of how this works. So I'll just dynamically create one real quick. So I click around here on the map, and I've just got a closed polygon loop. You can see I'm just creating some sort of perimeter. And then when I do this, I can hit draw polys, and then it goes in there and takes all those points and it breaks it up into triangles. So those are the triangles I'm talking about. So then I can actually hit a save to OBJ, let's say, uh, let's call this the meetup one. And there goes a generate OBJ. Oh, don't use that application. Oops. Let me. So you can hear, see here, I have all the verts, so every point I stored in 2D space. I have an X, Y, and Z, it's all in the same plane, it's a zero. Uh, the faces, which is the poly, so it says it takes vert number 12, number one, and number two, and that creates the first triangle. Two, three, and four creates the second triangle. And then uh, my program, the viewer, if there's no normals, it automatically determines them and creates them automatically. But you could have VNs in here, VTs, or texture points, or normal calculations as well. Uh, so that's a simple OBJ format, the basics of what you need. So you can take this and drop it into the viewer, and you can see this 2D plane inside of the <coughs> So, three basics now. Whenever we have some object in space, we want to be able to do a few things with it. Well, we want to be able to scale it to change its size. We want to be able to translate it around in a 3D environment. And we want to be able to rotate it. Now, usually we start out with uh, Euler angles, which we have the yaw, pitch, and roll here. So you can see that uh, pitch is going up and down on the nose like that on off or something. Yaw is moving it left and right like this. And roll is doing this on the object. Now the problem with Euler angles is that you can get, it's called gimbal lock. Anybody ever heard of gimbal lock? No, you guys have. Okay. Alright, so it's something, and I'll show you an example of it. It has some problems with some NASA stuff and everything in. Is that whenever you're doing these rotations, piecemeal like this, you can actually lock the object. And you may try to do a roll, but instead you get a pitch or something like that. And so this is a problem. It's the easiest way to get started is using this. The solution is to use quaternions. Quaternions are more advanced. Uh, but they're there. I just want to make sure you, you know that. If you ever were to build a system, you want to use quaternions, even though I'm going to show you, for simplicity, Euler angles. Okay. So I made this app just to kind of help you visualize what happens here. All right, so we have this same spaceship right here. And each one of these at the top here represent a different matrix. Right? So for every object, you have to calculate a matrix, each one of these. So we have a translate matrix, so I can grab this here and translate it on the x-axis back and forth. And you can see that the data right here on the matrix moves. So this would be the four by four matrix that represents the position of the object inside of the world. You can do that. You have scale. You can do uh, skew scales, which means that you're scaling it in different directions. So here's a 
scaling it in the x direction. And you can see that the major axis here shows the scale. So if I want to stretch it up in the y, make it something kind of fat or want to flatten out like a pancake, right? You can do that here. And so uh, give this a little bit here. So I have 1.5 in the x and 0.5 in the y. That's the second major. So then we have rotate. So I want to do a yaw. So I should see it do this. So you can see that when I grab this right here, I'm changing the yaw angle on it. Now that's a, uh, there's nothing really wrong with that. So let's show what happens with here. So I'm going to do a pitch and I'm going to pitch to 90 degrees. That's kind of the key. Or I'm going to try to pitch to 90 degrees. That's what's going to So I pitched it down, right? So now I'm going to do a yaw. And when you'd expect to do yaw, I would expect it to do this, right? Everybody kind of get that? So now let me see what happens when I do yaw. It's rolling, right? That's called a gimbal lock. That sucks. Because whenever you're in a game or you're in some 3D application, all of a sudden you're thinking this thing's going to roll and it pitches up, and you're like, hey, it's not doing what I'm telling it to do. It's all about the order in which you multiply these together. So if you were to change the order, you would get a gimbal lock in a different one. So usually in games or some type of 3D environment where you're moving around, through a view, which is what we call a camera, you don't let the camera roll, right? So if it does barrel rolls, you can get a gimbal on it, unless you use quaternion. So that usually will prevent it. So that's why in a lot of 3D environments, you can pan like this and look up, but you can't pan and then roll around, because then it would get you in a locked position where you couldn't get out of it. You wouldn't be able to get back and move normal. And this has to do with the computer not being able to understand its spatial relationship with X, Y, Z? Well, it's not the computer. It's just the math. It's that whenever you rotate 90 degrees, you take one of those rings, like you think of a gyroscope, and you actually put it in the same position as another ring. So you have two rings that are on top of each other. Yeah. So when you try to do that, it there's really no way for it to do that rotation. You, you've changed the axis. You've changed right. the Z to the X. Exactly. Right. So then when you try to do a roll, you're now on the wrong axis. So right. it doesn't work. So what quaternions do is they calculate the entire matrix in one step. So you don't go through this piecemeal process, but it's more advanced. It's actually a 4D vector. It calculates the axis of rotation rather than three different rotations. Interesting. So each of these matrices, so if you, you give a matrix uh, multiplication, you would basically just multiply all four of these matrices together. And this would come up with a final transform matrix. Every vert inside of that model on every update multiplies the vert's position by this model, by this matrix, and that's what puts it in 3D space. So that's the key. You have to be able to do this matrix multiplication here. With that, you're good to go. And that's kind of the foundation of it. So now when we start thinking about that real quick, and you think about some models that maybe have, I don't know, 6,000, 10,000 vertices inside of them. So like that ship may have 10,000 vertices. And I want to draw to the screen 60 times a second. And that's just one of them. So you can see real quick that it, you can't do this unless it's accelerated on the GPU. The GPU is made to do floating point math. Because it's made to do that, it can do it a heck of a lot faster than the CPU. So this is where the problem comes. We're actually doing these calculations 60 times a second on hundreds of thousands of verbs. So you're doing hundreds of thousands of calculations a second. And that becomes the issue. Yes? What about the distance from the Is this your Z? This one? Yeah. I'm just moving it. So it, it's a left handed coordinate system, so X is this way, Y is up, and Z is always into the screen. Okay. I wasn't thinking. 3D? Ah, well, it's, it's, okay. it's okay. It's a 3D lecture, but okay. <laughs> so that's fine. So this is up there, you can play with this too, just to kind of get an idea for it. It's usually a pretty good thing to set up with just to make sure your matrices are you got them calculating correctly, because if you don't, it's really hard to look at the final matrix and say whether or not it's correct. So usually something like this will help you make sure that you're getting the right answer. It's, it is. <laughs> okay, so that's getting the object in the right spot in the world. Now there's two other matrix that you have to calculate for every draw of the screen. The second one is the view matrix. Now this is where we get our artificial camera and 3D graphics. This is our view of the world. So I can move my view around the world or I can rotate the object. Either way, it would kind of look the same. Right? 
So what we do with graphics is we come up with this matrix that represents a fictional object that does not exist called a camera. It's just mathematically exists. And then what happens is everything that was created with that first matrix I just showed you for the object, which is what we call the world matrix, it gets transformed into what we call U space. So it's a different coordinate system. It's not the world's coordinate system. Now everything is based upon the camera's view. Okay? So to do that, you basically have three vectors. The right vector, the forward vector, and the up vector, just like you see here. Those three change. Whenever you start out, a lot of times you'll have them aligned with the X, Y, and Z. But as the game moves on, your application moves around, you start moving the camera around, they could be inverted, they could look at like anything, right? And so you have to be able to calculate those three vectors. So this is where you've got to know some vector math to be able to do this. Now there are some built-in functions which will say calculate view matrix. And you give it the point where the camera's at, the point at where it's looking at, and what you're calling up, which is usually the y-axis, and then it will calculate this matrix for you. Okay? Now the right up and look vectors are here, but then down you know, here at the bottom side of this, that dot isn't a multiplication dot, it's a dot product. Anybody ever heard of the dot product? One guy. All right, excellent. You guys, right? Okay, good. <laughs> so the dot product. This is the negative dot product of the actual position with the right up and view vectors. That creates your view matrix. So in the whole scheme of things, you're going to take that world matrix, then you're going to multiply it by this view matrix, and then we got one more we got to go through. So, so real quick, what is dot product? It's it's the mathematically or with the formula. Well, yeah, don't give me the formula. Okay, just, yeah. it's the projection of one vector onto another. Okay, okay. so these the the right up and look are normalized vectors, so they're basically just pointing in a direction. Their magnitude is one. Right. And whenever I dot this, it tells me how much of this position is in the up direction, how much is in the look or the right. From direction. the camera's perspective. Exactly. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. And so it's the projection of one make vector onto another. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Just using physics all the time, you need to multiply vectors together, you've got dot or cross. This is usually what you do. So this is a dot. It returns a value, not a vector. So it's a scalar product. All right. The next one is the projection matrix. The last one you've got to calculate every frame. Every time you're going to draw, you have to calculate this one. This is what gives your scene a 3D look. Our screen is not 3D, it is a 2D plane, right? So we have to give the illusion of 3D somehow. That's the projection. So I'm not an artist, I couldn't draw it, I could do it mathematically, but I couldn't physically draw something like this. You know, you gotta have the vanish point, right? It's gotta scale it out. Things that are closer to the camera need to look bigger, things that are further away need to diminish in size, this sort of stuff. All those 3D tricks that you do when you're drawing on two paper, that's what this performs for us. So you can see this uh, truncated frustrum right here. And this is what we have, what we call the far plane, which is the furthest thing out we're gonna draw. Anything that is beyond that plane we ignore because it's gonna be outside the screen. We're not gonna, we're gonna say it's too far away to see. We have the near plane, which is the closest plane to us. That's saying anything that is closer than that, we're also going to ignore. So the only other things that are in between those two uh, planes are visible in the camera space. And then we've got the width and the height aspect ratios, which tells us how squashed our camera is going to be. So the key to this is if you want to match this to be the screen resolution size, right, or the window size. Because what can happen if you have a, a rectangle screen, you're going full screen, but then you draw in a square, everything will be distorted. It will be squished, right, or it will be stretched out depending on which way you go. So this, the far near plane just kind of tell you to clip out everything beyond those bounds. And then the field of view and the aspect ratio match to your screen resolution. And so that gives you a camera that has the proper uh, look of what your screen is. Does that make sense? Fairly simple equation to come up with. It's not really that hard. This one's pretty simple. There can be a lot more stuff you can do with this later on, but just for the basics, that's it. That's all you got to calculate. So this will be your final matrix. So what you do now is that every frame, every object you want to draw, you have to calculate the world matrix for every object, and then you have to calculate the view and the projection matrix. The view and the projection <coughs> matrix are the same for all objects, but obviously every object in the world would have a different world <coughs> matrix because it will be in a different location, a different scale, a different rotation, so you have to calculate that for every single object. 
I want to make sure you kind of get the picture that it's not for every single vert inside that model file. Every vert is multiplied by that one matrix, which translates it and scales and puts it in the right position. Right? So that's a lot of multiplications, a lot of these things to build, and most of the engines have built in things for this. There's several of them, DirectX, OpenGL, all of them have a function that you can call, which is generate field of view matrix left handed, something like that, and you just put in the screen width, the height, uh, near and far plane, and it'll create that matrix for you automatically. But it's helpful to be able to know how to do it too. Yes. Uh, real quick, I use After Effects, <coughs> and then I'll try to do some um, perspective distortion with some of the plugins and everything else. And a lot of times, it, my machine will go, uh, uh, no way, mass too, too, too much. Is that because of the, that I'm, I'm just playing with all these vectors and moving things around? That my actual math is extending beyond my aspect ratio. It's probably not that. It's probably that you've actually wrapped them around or something, and so now you're drawing over itself, and it gets into like an infinite sort of loop thing, like uh -huh. that cotangent up there. You know, tangent's really dangerous because you can divide by zero. Right. And then that's you know not good. I right? gotcha. It's bad. And so that's usually what's happening if you're doing some divide by zero. Yeah, I'm an artist. I, can hey, that. I get you. I can, <laughs> you do. I can do the math. That's good. All right. So all of that kind of leads up to your the just 3D graphic basics. So you've kind of leveled up now. That's your basics, right? So now you've got 3D graphics. You know what WebGL is. So now we need to go talk about the second part: performance. What can it do? How fast is it? Now. This was something that, when I first started out, I hadn't done 3D graphics on the web. I'd done it with DirectX and C++, and I thought, oh, this is the web. You can't do anything fast on the web. And this is actually what made me change and become so heavy in web apps with seeing this performance. So I created another little demo. You can look at it real quick. And what I wanted to find out was how many of these objects could I draw on the screen at once? Now I wanted to do something that was just native WebGL, no plugins, no engines, because I just wanted to know, without anybody's optimizations, because you can always find tricks to make it faster, what's just the raw throughput? So I started building this right here. To kind of go through, I just keep adding objects and adding objects. Now remember, uh, key is to keep it above 60 frames per second. Now this is a, I had an old MacBook until I dropped it, and now I have a new MacBook. <laughs> the old MacBook uh, was, one of the very first unibody ones. So it's just Core 2 Duo, just kind of base stuff. And it would max out around 400 units. Now this is the uh, one with the i7 in it, and I can't max it out with this demo now. It used to not be a problem, I wasn't rewriting the demo. But the night, so. how, many, how many polygons are is that object? So that's what I want to show you. I forget the number per object, but here I'm still maxing out 60 frames per second. Right about there, it doesn't really matter because now everything's being clipped outside of the near right. plane, so it's not being drawn. So right here, I'm getting about 750,000 verts that are being drawn 60 times a second. So you take 750,000, multiply by 60, and that's how many calculations are being done on the GPU a second. That's not too shabby. All right, I can easily push a million verts on this machine. Right. Now this is the key is, okay, this is a new MacBook i7, awesome. I go to the, you know, an Android phone, no, you're not getting that, <laughs> right. right? But, you know, this came up last time we got to talk, and it's kind of an interesting thing. I was really looking to find out what mattered, because we see all these new red displays, right? And I, I don't know how I feel about those yet, but, you know, a lot of, like, artist people, I guess, love them, but my eyes aren't that good, so I can't really tell the difference. Uh, but, so I was looking at the Nexus 7 and the Nexus 10. The Nexus 10, had amazing quad core or whatever their big chip is in it, and twice the resolution is one of these kind of high DPI screens. The Nexus 7, on the other hand, lower grade hardware and a lot lower resolution. So, you know, I, the guys I follow on Twitter, I was asking them at Google, the guy who does WebGL for Google, saying, which one's better? I mean, which one can do better? On one hand, you've got a really good graphics core, the Nexus 10 but you've got almost quadruple the number of pixels it's got to draw to on the screen. Right. So how does that translate? Anybody have any guess which one's better? It's the lower one. The six. 
Or the seven, was the next seven? The <laughs> seven. The next I was tripping up. The next to seven actually performs better. Yeah. And uh, if you actually look on the online test, I had a guy who sent me a link to some tests that were done. It's actually impressive. So if you're drawing off screen, which means that it's not bounded by the refresh rate or anything, the Nexus 10 can do a lot better. But if we're talking about just getting something going on mobile, it seems like the high resolution screens are really adding more complexity than they are helping. So, and I think you get that even some CSS and some other stuff too, that it really becomes more of an issue. It could even with what you were talking about, the media queries, that kind of throws things off a little bit because now you can't use just the 750 right. and stuff like that because they're all different dimensions now. Double the DPI. So, I don't have one, so I haven't tried it, but I mean, you will probably find similar that even though they're smaller devices, but you know, the hardware is what you would call inferior, because the pixel count is lower, you can usually get better response. And I don't know the S3 what its pixel count is, but if it's crazy, then uh, that's going to be bad. One thing, too, you see is this, uh, this light wave move across the screen. So I'm actually doing real time light calculations, and I'm calculating the light of every pixel on the screen on where it would look like this object. So I'm not just calculating the positions, but I'm dynamically calculating the color to get that lighting calculation. So that's the most uh, intensive lighting calculation I could come up with. It gives you the best look, but it's intensive because you're calculating it per pixel. So definitely, you can see real quick, if you're doing a per pixel calculation and you quadruple your pixel count, it's gonna make a huge difference in what you can do. So just because the device is bigger, better, and better, does not mean it'll perform better when it comes to this technology, strictly because so this was interesting. So uh, this was just a demo to show what I did. Now, you know, being an engineer background, so it's always want to uh, not just see the demo. I want somebody to show me the data, <laughs> show me the numbers, what you're talking about. So this is kind of, uh, I think yeah, you can kind of see it uh, being clipped a little bit. But so on this kind of computer, I could get uh, 858,000 verbs or about 500,000 triangles being drawn on the screen. Actually, this one can do better, but this is the same story. Uh, on uh, OS X type computer, uh, Windows with a Core 2 Duo, uh, the graphics card matters, right? So the better the graphics card, that's where the calculations are being done. So that's when you start looking at WebGL, you don't look at CPU as much as you look at the GPU and see what it can do. So you can see that my old computer was the one on the bottom. It was like 590,000 uh, verts and 333,000 polys it could do. Now that's still really good. Now if I look at objects, and I say they have about five to 10,000 verts each, well I can get you know 50 objects on the screen. That's plenty to do something really interactive and engaging. Right? If it was one or two, then I might have a little bit more trouble. But this is enough to actually start becoming really useful. I've seen several demos already ported over to the Nexus 7, and they're working and stuff, so it's it's coming along. Mobile isn't there as much yet. WebGL on mobile is not uh, something I would say you're going to shoot for right now because it's just hardware's not quite there yet. I have a feeling that's why Apple hasn't just run with it yet because it's just not there. And it won't run as fast. Now, you can do some porting and some scaling where you draw a really small image and then you stretch it. But if you're stretching an image, you get distortion. So it depends on how much distortion you can allow or how good it looks and things like that. So that's, a, that's kind of an issue, but it's still still there. It's still coming along. Desktop, without a doubt, you can do it. There's no problems. You, in fact, uh, it was an Unreal Engine, which is one of the biggest other engines. They're porting their engine over right now to WebGL. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot of success in that. So, so how does it look compared to browsers? So this is the the older computer that I dropped, looking at it, Chrome gave me the fastest uh, frame rates. It still performs pretty fast. Now, with some of the new stuff that's just come out this, this month, I haven't redone the test, uh, but Firefox really was actually caught up dramatically. So right here, it's at the lowest, but with stuff that just came out, it's dramatically faster. So they have just rechanged their architecture. They actually went from a single-threaded rendering system to a multi-core threaded rendering system like Chrome WebKit was using, which dramatically changed their uh, rate. Safari is now the worst performing, even though they're not here. It's just new. So, and I think that's why it's still under development. I didn't do an offer, but I should have, but I didn't. So, uh, you can see 
the draw call. So this is how many times I was calling draw in a given test. So to keep my frame rate at 60 frames per second, I could do on Chrome 450 units, which means I could draw 450 different things and still keep it above 30 frames per second. Right? So definitely there was no problems there. Right? Now, understand that unless if all you're going to do is draw an object, then this isn't a problem. If you want to interact with the object or make right. it do stuff, then you can't max out the draw bar. Right? You've got to be able to do other stuff besides draw the three objects on the screen. Right? That's where the multi-threading talk came out of the game last month or whatever it was for January. So here's the key. So is all of this in JavaScript? Uh, oops, wrong way. No, not exactly. <laughs> There's another language you have to learn, GLSO. Right, so this is the sh uh, graphics language, shader language. Uh, this is key, and what this works on is this is a language that runs on the GPU. Right, so this is a GPU language. If you were doing DirectX, you would use HLSO. So the nice thing is, is that this is the exact same language for desktop to mobile, because the GPU language is consistent. So you don't, if you have something written that runs on a desktop, in OpenGL, it can run on desktop and WebGL. GL itself does not change. Okay? So you just have to use the, the right standard. So when you're talking about this, anybody have experience with shaders? You're good. All right. Excellent. So we have two types of shaders we're working with here. The first one is called a vertex shader. All right, so let's kind of see here, I have a sphere, and I'm calculating, I, I'm not gonna, this thing is calculating the light this is legit, by the way, but it's calculating the light at every vert on the sphere as it rotates. Mm -hmm. The job of the vertex shader is to get all of the verts of the model in the right position in the world. It has to output the final position in screen space for that vert. So it actually does the multiplication of the world view and projection matrix together in the vertex shader. That's what it accomplishes. When it's done, it has given that over <coughs> homogeneous flip space, but it's really just where it is on the screen, okay? That's its goal. So real quickly, your 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 light source is, is moving and shifting? No, the light source is constant, but what it is is the verts are not in a straight line, right? So right. as it's calculating, it looks like the light is moving. Right, so in the real world, that light would just remain in the exact same spot. With a low poly model, you're saying it's gonna shift? Exactly. Because it's saying, where is how much light does this vertice have at this current position? Mm -hmm. And since it's not continuous across, I don't have a vert every single spot, you get this jump. Which is why we go to the pixel shader, which is why I showed this one. Mm -hmm. This one does the coloring of each of those verts, or the, sorry, not the verts, but the triangles, those polys. So those three verts make up a triangle. The pixel or fragment shader, depending if you're DirectX or OpenGL, calculates what the color is across the face of that triangle. Now it's continuous, so even though the sphere isn't turning, if it was turning here, you wouldn't be able to tell because it would look like the light's in the exact same right. spot. Because right. okay, it's calculating across the entire face. So this is when I was showing you a minute ago about light that was moving across the surface. I was doing a fragment-based or pixel-based lighting. If I had done a vertex-based, it's a lot less calculations, right? Because less there are more pixels per triangle than there are points on the triangle. There's three verts for the triangle, but I have a lot of shading in between. So whenever I do something per pixel, it adds a lot more complexity in the calculations. Right? It really amps it up. So it's definitely something you do. Now, if you get around that, you can increase the vert count, but then you increase the vert count, you're increasing the number of calculations yeah, there. So you've got to figure out which way you want to go. There are some other tricks you can do, but that's, you know, what do you have to talk about next, right? So that's kind of two basic shaders. Now, what do these shaders take in? Uh, the inputs, what we call attributes, into a vertex shader. Those are all those things that were in the OBJ file I showed you. It's the position of the vert, it's the texture coordinate of the vert, the normal of the vert, anything that describes the vertex itself, right? That's what's fed in. It's the raw data from your model files is the input into the vertex shader. Now we have two other types of inputs you can pass in. One's called uniforms, and these are programming. Uh, if you want to connect up a variable in JavaScript and have it run inside the shader so that you can pass data in, that's what's called a uniform. It's the constant over the entire draw of the object, so every vert has that same value that can be calculated. We have samplers. These are textures. 
you want to pass a texture in so that you can sample the color out of a texture in a specific position, you can pass that in as well. Okay? Uh, there are temporary variables that you can create. and You can pass those between vertex shader and fragment shaders. The output is what we call varies. So varies are outputted from the vertex shader, and those are inputs into the pixel shader. So you can output, you can calculate something like the position of the object in view space, or the position of the object in world space. You can output those and then have access to them inside of the pixel shader. That's possible. The uh, one thing that is mandatory that you output is the geo position. This is the final position of the vert. You have to output this from the vertex shader, otherwise it'll fail because it, that's the whole purpose of it, right? So as a minimum, you have to pass in the vertex model, verts, multiply by the world view projection, and I'll point the GL position. If you do all that, that's your most basic vertex shader, and that'll have to take care of it. All that's done on the GPU. So these streams are set up for every model that stream in all of the verts into the GPU and does the calculations. Does GL stand for global? Uh, graphics language. Graphics language. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, there we go. Right. So, uh, in fact, whenever you're looking at the OpenGL, all the API calls are GL draw something, GL something. If you name the 3D context of the canvas GL, all you do is GL dot draw, and that's the same call. So that's why you can look at an OpenGL book and write WebGL code. Okay. Next one, fragment shader. So as you can see, the inputs into the fragment shader are all the variants that you just created in your vertex shader. And you can take the same uniforms that you pass in the vertex or the same ones that you can pass into your fragment. And the textures are the same, temporary variables. Output of the vertex shader is the color of the pixel. That's what it has to output. Right? So the most simple, you can just make it just white. You don't have to do anything, right? You can just the vertex shader can be nothing more than a single line that says GL frag color one 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 one. That would be it. That would be a white color on the surface of the object. Right? Now, if you sample a texture or do some morphing, add lighting, there's a lot more you can do. But that's what it does. And it calculates that color over every poly that it draws to the screen every time. So to get a kind of a concept of the pipeline, the graphics pipeline, this is a great, this is a, from Opera's dev site, I really like it. It kind of shows how all of the WebGL comes together. So the first thing you're gonna have are vertex arrays and index arrays and JavaScript. All right, those are, you store your actual models inside these arrays, they're usually typed arrays. That was one of the keys of making JavaScript, or making WebGL work on the browsers. Those are then bounded up and float into the GPU. Then from there, they go into the vertex shader and it calculates the position of every vertex point. And the input that usually supplies is those three matrices. As minimum, you gotta supply those three matrices, right? And then every vert will be passed into the shader, multiplied by those, and output it in position. Then the triangle assembly comes. So then once you've done those calculations, every triangle is put together and then that triangle is sent over and colored, or it goes into the rasterizer. The rasterization is actually taking the 3D object and converting it into a 2D image, right? So that takes the 2D image, and then it passes through the shader, which then colors in that 2D image. And that's how it builds up your object. So those are the steps. Anywhere there's user input, those are things that you can pass in to modify it. Where you don't see user input, like say going from the vertex shader to the rasterizer, you have no input there, right? That's all done directly. Now, this whole shader base, there is OpenGL that does not use shaders, right? This is what we call the programmable pipeline because it has programs that now are part of the graphics pipeline. Uh, the ES part of the OpenGL that I was talking about earlier, what they did is they stripped out all the inefficient stuff, which is the stuff that does not use shaders because that means it's doing it on the CPU side. And as we know, that's not efficient. I already showed you how much of a difference it makes. So that's why in a mobile device or anything that's embedded, you want to take advantage of the hardware. So you can you have to use shaders in WebGL or any OpenGL ES system, it has to be shader based. Okay. So if you are doing OpenGL on a mobile device in a native app and not using shaders, you are wrong. Okay. Because you are not taking advantage of the hardware that was built into it to do 3D graphics. You're doing it manually. So we should all be switching to this anyway. We shouldn't have a problem with that. Because uh, if you're not, you're really, you're, you're maxing out the, the 
device. Now there are some more advanced stuff here where you can actually write out to create dynamic textures in uh, OpenGL. So in that demo I showed you where the AI had all that grid of spheres on the ground, the actual grid that is actually a texture being applied to a canvas that was created in WebGL. So you can dynamically create textures, change them up, wrap them around an object. Uh, I want to have a video playing in the middle of my 3D world. I can do it with this. You grab the video texture every frame from your loop, you throw it over, wrap it on a texture. I can then go do filtering. So think uh, Instagram, something like that. You can apply algorithms to do any kind of filtering you want on the image and save it back as a texture. And that's hardware accelerated filtering, so it's a lot faster. Um, let's see, I have a couple of options on the screen, and one is obscured by the other. For the obscured one, you don't want to be drawing that or doing any calculations on it. Sure. Uh, is that something that was done by the perfect shader or the triangle assembly part? Yes, it can be. It, you have some options in there, and there's even the idea of the object if, uh, like the keyboard here, you can't see the keyboard. Because or the, this side of the screen is the back side of the object, right. so we can actually turn on culling and clipping and things like that to say, okay, if it's the back side, skip it. Okay, and that's part of the shader language. Well, it, you actually just set the flags and turns that on automatically. Ah, okay. you, one thing you have to do is called depth filtering. Right. And you turn on depth filters, and it says, okay, if this is uh, okay. it's obscure. It, it used to be a thing you had to do like uh, binary space partitioning. Or well, you like still that. have to do that, but that won't take care of this problem. Okay. Now, the key is to what this all means if I draw in the wrong order, it doesn't work. So if I draw the objects back to front, right, then they're never obscured, right? right? And then I just keep redrawing things over and over and over. If I draw them front to back, then the very biggest thing will be drawn. So then when I go to draw the final thing that's in the back, if it's completely obscured, then it wouldn't be drawn at all. And you'd say, this is the optimization stuff I was talking about. So changing your draw order, all these little things you can do to really push do you have things like depth of field? Uh, I don't have the demo for it, but you can do it. I mean, I, I can show you a demo after this that has it in there. It's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, you can do depth of field where you do a blur on everything. It's not automatic. You have actually got to code that, right? Mm -hmm. And you start doing blur effects, Gaussian blurs around it, and you give a focus. There's a really cool one uh, done by Greg Mann from uh, Google, who did one with blades of grass. So you got blades of grass blowing, and you can change the depth of field and change the number of grass blades that are blowing in the wind, it's really cool. Uh, so, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, really cool stuff that you can do. All right. So that's your pipeline. That's kind of the way it's set up. So, one up, new programming language, GLSL. You have to know that to be able to do WebGL. You can get some basics, some shader code, get it all done for you. So now let's talk about, we know what WebGL is, kind of know some basics of 3D graphics. And we understand some of the components of WebGL. Well, it makes all that up. So now let's look at how do we get this whole thing even started. Now, I'm not going to have much code in here. I'm just going to talk about the steps. No point in seeing the code at this point. So, three things you have to initialize. You got to initialize your canvas, which is the easiest thing to do of all of these things. You have to create, download, compile all your shader code. And then you've got to initialize all your models and get all those vertex, buffers, index, and all that stuff loaded up into JavaScript objects. Those are your three pieces you got to accomplish. I'm sorry, I couldn't find pictures to go with this. It's just, I just don't know what to put as a picture. So I just got words here for a little while. First step in your canvas initialization, create a canvas object. First step, set its width and its height. This is important because that's going to be your viewport, right? That's where that comes up. So as soon as you do that, you call to get the 3D context for the canvas object. Right? So if you've done canvas animations before, anything like that, you've probably got the 2D context. Now we're getting the 3D context. Just as a side note, just like, uh, something I was trying to mess with, you cannot do 2D and 3D on the same canvas. Once you call get 3D context, it nullifies it, and then you call to a 2D version of it, just get ignored. So you have to kind of pick. Yes. Oh, sure. Can you use WebGL in the 2D context? Well, n no, because it's not. You can do the math, and I'll show you some alternatives. Uh, 3D CSS is really where you want to go. You can do, let me rephrase that. You can do 3D graphics in a 2D context, right? It's the same math, right? So you're doing the rasterization and the filling the pixels all yourself, 
it's very, you'll see something nice and rotating in WebGL, and then you do it in 2D, you'll go, because it can't handle it. It can't do that many calculations, right? There are the. Well, I was thinking more along the lines of I have this plot that I'm doing in 2D, and instead of using JavaScript to draw that, you have to canvas using WebGL to sure. draw it fast. Like if currently, they, I remember like in 88, you used to pay like 20 minutes to plot the screen. Right. And now it's four times the resolution, and JavaScript only takes half a second. Right. So I wonder if with the WebGL, it would be faster if we drew it for the 2D. Probably. I, have a, I actually have a demo where I'm doing some statistics model analysis where I'm doing bar charts in 3D. I can show you that as well. Uh, it's, it's fast, so yeah, definitely. Especially uh, like bars or something, they're only eight verts, so they're really small, so you can draw them, I mean, insanely fast. There's not really an issue there. Uh, so yeah, you can, but if you start trying to do WebGL, not on WebGL, but just take the math and do it in the 2D context, You've taken away all the advantage of WebGL. It's no longer hardware accelerated. You're not sending anything to the GPU. You're doing all that math on the CPU, and it cannot perform. Okay. So, uh, and there's great like 3JS is probably the graph. The WebGL engine I would recommend to anybody. It's one of the best ones out there, and they have a 2D canvas fallback, so that if you're trying to do something. And WebGL can be initialized, it will fall back to the 2D canvas and it will draw all the pixels. It will do that entire pipeline on the 2D canvas and draw it because it's the exact same math. I mean, you can do the exact same thing, but it just, you will see a huge difference in performance. It cannot handle it. So you can go from 30 to 5. Or 5. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Or, or less. I mean, it can be, just depending on the complexity of the scene. If you're doing something like 8 bursts for a bar, you could probably get away with it. But if you're not, and you're doing something like some of the demos I'm going to I've already shown you, you won't be able to do it effectively. But since then, I guess you do something to this stuff and you can be able to do it almost like doing 2D side scroll and that stuff, mm -hmm. but using OpenGL to do it. Sure. Um, it sounds like you're saying don't do that. No, I'm saying use OpenGL. I'm saying. Oh, I'm sorry, okay, use WebGL. Yeah, okay. I'm saying you can't try to get the 2D context of the canvas right. and use 3D technology because okay. it's not actually okay. going to the GPU anymore. Right, but I mean, if you had like a, almost like a, a polygon with almost, let's say, zero depth, right? right? And you just text your math onto it. Sure. Well, then yeah. you could still use that. It's just it wouldn't do very much on the, on the 3D aspect. Right. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, in fact, you know, the experience I have with Canvas animations, uh, they, they're not there yet. They're, they try to do some hardware acceleration, but I, you can outperform with the div. The, in the browsers can draw HTML5 and recalculate the position of HTML5 or HTML code quicker than they can draw a screen on the Canvas. It's just not there. But, wow. Okay, that's, I've done that's good several know. tests. And I mean, I haven't tested it recently, but as of three, six months ago, still, I mean, I could almost double or quadruple the number of sprites I could have moving on screen animating with just doing HTML, just inlining HTML. That's all I have to do. It's much faster. I'm hoping for someday that changes, but as of right now, it's not. So, so what you're kind of saying is there is no real HTML solution anytime near on the, on the horizon that can compete with what Flash could do. Well, WebGL can compete with it. <laughs> WebGL and WebFlash use the same sort of back end. So if you write your code properly, you can get some truly high performing stuff. Right, but the, the problem is you don't have a, um, you, you, don't, you don't have a program in which animators with a timeline and anything else. No, can, not can the tools. Do, can, you don't have the tools developed sure. yet to, to produce things in Correct. a timely fashion that could anyway come near Flash. Sure, I, I can go with that, yeah. yeah. Now, that's market opportunity. Well, and Adobe's trying to do that, but I, I, I yeah. don't think they're there yet. But I mean, the, you, the technology is not the limitation anymore, right? The capability of what it can do, it can do it. Uh, Flash has the exact same problems with mobile, which is why it's not being supported anymore. That's so exactly that it's right. not, it wasn't that WebGL, I mean, it's, it's there. It's just 
mobile devices aren't there yet. That's really the issue with that. All right. Going out of time. So set clear color. That's the last thing. So that's every time you redraw the screen, you clear it with some color. So you got to set what that color is. Next thing is the shader initialization. So you have to get a copy of the code. Now, there is, they added a new tag that you could put in HTML to embed your shader code into the HTML file. I don't personally do that. I just do uh, Ajax calls and get a VS file or whatever I call it, download it as text, and you gotta get that code. So then you take that code and you create a WebGL fragment and vertex shader objects. So you get those two objects, you stuff them with the code, and then you compile them up, and that should give you now a compiled version of the vertex and the fragment shaders. Then you create what's called a program, and you attach a fragment shader and a vertex shader to a program object, and it links those together, uh, programs them up, and then now you actually have a full WebGL program for the GPU, okay? And you call the set active on that program object, and so now every draw call will be sent to that code to do the calculations, okay? So you can have multiple shaders set up on a computer. You can create multiple programs if you want to do different effects or anything like that. And all you do is just change whichever one's active and then you do all your drawing and it goes to those shaders. Kind of make sense? So then the next thing you have to do is connect your JavaScript to your uh, shader variables. So we have these things that says get attribute uh, location. So what this does is you query the shader file for the variable name. So you have a uniform in there, and you have the text of that uniform. You say, where inside of your file is this variable located? So it's actually giving you a memory spot. It returns back to you. And then whenever you call the enable vertex shader, you pass it the actual location that you got from the get location, and then it will connect your JavaScript object to stream it over to that specific variable. Does that make sense? So we've got two different things running, two different completely memory maps. JavaScript has its own memory map. GPU has its own memory map. And so we have to find a way to connect this JavaScript object to the GPU variable. Everybody get that? So that's what this process is. You get its location, then you say, okay, connect this JavaScript object to that location in the shader. So that's where the attributes, the same sort of thing for the uniforms. I kind of wanted to show, they have this uh, gl.uniform and you have matrix 4FV. So that's a four by four matrix of floats vectors or a uniform uh, vector three of floats or a uniform one integer, right? So these are all those things that you'll just see XX because it depends on what the variable is. So every type of variable it supports, you'll have a different three letter abbreviation to describe it, okay? Same sort of thing, you tell it the location that's inside of the shader and then you say this is the value of the JavaScript. So you're basically passing a pointer to the JavaScript object and you're telling it where it's located in each side of the GLSL code in the shader. So that connects them up. That's how they connect. And then mesh initialization. Oh. There we go. Mesh initialization. So those objects now that you've streamed in, those models, you've stripped them out so they've got all the vertexes in an array, all the indices in an array, all the data is in JavaScript objects. And then you have to create buffer objects, GL buffers. So you create a GL buffer bot object, you bind to it, which sets it active, and then you fill it full of the data. You'll say this JavaScript object now goes into this buffer. You create another one, bind to it, and say this JavaScript object now goes into this buffer. And so you create all your buffers, all your objects, and you fill them in. And so every object will have its own set of buffers that it stores its vertex data in, its color data, its texture data, all that stuff. And this is all done on a per frame basis? If you're uh, this is initialization. So oh, this is done still. once. Okay, right. right. Now, the, this stuff right here, where you're binding the attributes, this is done on a per draw basis because every time you call a draw call, it's whatever you have bound up here. Right. So, you don't have to call the get location anymore because you could have saved that, but you do have to say enable this or set this here because every object is going to set up a different set of positions, a different set of color or lighting variables or whatever, right? So you have to rebind those every time. So then, after you've done that, this is your update and draw. So if you, on your update call, 
you'll do something like position, scale, rotation, do whatever it is you're gonna do to change the object on the screen, and then you call the draw. So the draw, first thing you're gonna do is set the uniforms, which is what I just showed you. You have to re-say that this variable is now pointing to this location, so for every object they're set up properly. And then you bind and set the vertex buffers. You already loaded them, now you have to bind them. So whenever you call the last one, the draw call, everything is set up in the shader program correctly for that specific object. So every object you draw, you will have to redo those three steps. Set the uniforms, uh, bind and set the vertex buffers, and then call the draw. Those are the keys. Um, now when you're doing your animation, you want to use the request animation frame uh, call because it it will it allows the browser to try to sync the draw. If you use a set timeout function, then it'll force the redraw of the screen at whatever time you've set. If you say, hey, this is an animation, so I'm going to be doing it a lot. It will actually try to set up the CSS redraws or the HTML redraw of the screen with the animation, and you can get a dramatic performance increase by allowing the browser to try to optimize when that draw happens. Okay, so it's not a hard set time. That kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. okay. with, um, let's say you need something to happen at thirty hertz. How do you how would you set up something? I mean, if it's got to be exact, then yes, yes, that's the only way to make it exact, right? But if it can be 30.01 hertz, then use the question frame. Okay, so that's it. So that's WebGL in a nutshell. Uh, it's 3D graphics in a nutshell with WebGL on top of it and all kinds of stuff. So, yeah. uh, so now let's uh, look at a demo. So, I kind of, so this kind of show you uh, how this all comes together is a WebGL demo called Made Resistance. Uh, it's WebGL based. It will use GamePad APIs. It's actually two player. Um, it has AI autonomous movement and it's multi-threaded on the loading. Uh, so you can actually check that out if you want. Let's go ahead and run this. Did you, did you have the URL for your demo? Uh, this one? Yeah. OR? GameTheoryLabs.com. It's all running on my home server, so if it's slow, uh, I've got to deal with it. <laughs> but once it's JavaScript, so once you get it, you know it's good. But you know, and it'll cache it and everything. Like right now, it's loading up the uh, I think the space station, which is really big. So if you're going to this, we're competing. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. So well, but well, I'll not compete with you until later. <laughs> okay, you do have your two data center if you want to <laughs> No, it's time. time. <laughs> so, uh, it'll come up in a second. So, uh, this is uh, running inside of my little framework that I've set up. So, while it's loading, mm -hmm. I'm old enough to remember Vermil, virtual reality markup language, <coughs> that, that everybody, you know, same type of hype. It was, oh my gosh, this is going to be the cool new 3D thing, and, <laughs> and it's all in the web, and blah, 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 and it went nowhere. Man. I agree. Yeah. But you know what's funny is that the people that did that mm -hmm. are the same people that are leading this. Well, no, I believe it. So there's because they go, dude, now's our time. Yeah, and <laughs> you're you're going to see this is getting a lot more support than, especially because gaming has become mm -hmm. such a big industry. Mm -hmm. This is getting its support, so it's not the same. Uh, that was before its time. Just well, well, the only the only issue I see is that the fact that you have the uh, performance. Is limited on this, it may have the same issue that Flash does. Well, there's one there's one thing that I think is going to change this, and they haven't announced it yet. I talked to guys at Google, they said, Yeah, we're working on it, we're just not telling anybody we're working sure. on it. Uh, they're gonna put this in a allow you to put it in a web worker. As soon as they do that, I can now throw my graphics off into a thread and let it run as fast as it wants and not walk up my UI, not seeing the stuff, and that will change stuff. Because now, we have to get out of the idea that we have single-threaded cores, things like we have multi-threaded cores, we have to start using multi-threaded. If I had my way, whenever I teach programming, we would just start multi-threaded. I think it's a paradigm shift, and you should just learn it from the ground up now, because that's our future. It's almost like having a server-side render farm. Right, you can do that. there's actually a guy that did that. That's pretty, pretty cool. Okay. Uh, I gotta make sure I got the right.
ink pad even is a little finicky. Whenever uh, sometimes Chrome will require you to actually restart the browser to, con to detect its connection. See, now you're getting slammed in your gameplay. I have the video back up, but I should just go ahead and show the. Uh, Yeah, there was this game theory guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nice. So there's the uh, that's the physics of 3D bounding volumes. Uh, I'll I'll die because it's two player here. I'll shoot a missile. So if he connected the other controller. Could, uh, it'll do the missiles. And, uh, I don't want to make people sick. I just died. <laughs> <laughs> but this is you can restart it. So, it's so what's going on there with the textures? Uh, this right here, what I did is I wanted to visually see the 3D bounding volumes I'm using for physics, so that I can't fly through stuff. So these are the physics volumes that bound the space station. So I can restart here. You'll see I'll bounce off this. I can't go into it. Oh, it's bounded I see. by that. And then whenever they shoot at me, you see their uh, their bullets. I and when they collide with it, it turns pink so I can detect formations and things like that. Okay. Alright, so I'm doing 3D physics calculations, rigid body physics calculations, AI calculations that they're flying around with. All this still running at 60 frames per second. Nice, and this is inside just a regular. Oh, yeah. Okay. Wow. Uh, so it's all there, all work, so it's not fake. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, cool. Let's go a few more things. There are options. 3D CSS is becoming a real <coughs> contender, especially if you want to do 2D stuff and you want to do mobile stuff. 3D CSS is pretty awesome. If you have any experience with 3D CSS, so you know that's what's rotating the 3D object around the screen and stuff like that, so you take div elements and move them around. What's cool is that there's a matrix function that you can set in 3DSS. That matrix function is the view matrix, is the matrix that you calculate in the shader. Same one. So if you were to do the WebGL stuff, it becomes a very easy port to do something in 3D CSS because the math is the same thing. You back up to that exact same matrix right. and that becomes your 3D CSS. So you can reuse the data. That's right. So it, all you're changing is the render engine, but none of the calculations. So it's pretty effective. This is a pretty cool uh, demo that a guy did. Let me get to the right screen here. Let me. Here it is. Uh, works best in Safari. Oh, that's the wrong one. Where you change it. So this is a. It looks like Marathon. Somebody likes Liechtenstein. <laughs> Someone like you. Oh, this is oh, kind of a So here we go. So this is all HTML and just div elements, right? There's no WebGL here. There's nothing more than just div tags inside of an HTML page, right? Nice and smooth, no issues there. This can run on an iPad, no problem. It's not WebGL. Same, cap same technology as far as the calculations of 3D graphics go, but you can definitely port it over to div elements. So, so why is this running so smooth? What I, I guess it's not a 3D CSS you know, lecture, but I mean, what's what's the the primary gut Good difference? Question. Excellent question. It's because 3D CSS is sent to the GPU and the hardware accelerator. That's what makes a difference. Okay. So if you use 2D transforms, you don't get it. 3D transforms are all done GPU based. And when you use the request animation frame, it's all synced up together, optimized flow, and actually does the calculations all the time. And now they've got CSS shaders or whatever. They changed, they don't call it CSS shaders anymore, what they're calling it now. But you're going to be able to have shader language inside of the 2D side now with CSS. And now you know what shaders. Kind of got that idea there. Same thing. So 
no reason you can't fall back to something like this. This is using real time lighting, everything. So, <laughs> tech demo, tech demo. Thank <laughs> you. All right, so there's, uh, there's that. Uh, you can also do 2.5D, so isometric view stuff, and that's another way to round it. Uh, you can try to do it in Canvas, or if you have a WebGL and you want to convert over to 2D to do a top down view, then you can obviously switch to 2D mode and it works pretty well. But uh, 3D CSS is going to gain a lot of traction because yeah. it's, it's really giving you that super responsive look. You know, this is some of the stuff that Facebook jacked up whenever they tried to do their mobile app. You know, they, just, they did not use the technology right, they just didn't. That's why it sucked. I mean, that was just it. They also it's had right. less it's than there. 24 uh, engineers working on it. Right. You know, if you're not going to spend the money on the right. on the personnel, it's not going to work. Yeah, and everybody's seen the. They were just the wrong people. Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook is. If you, you should check it out. If you use Facebook at all, you can see that the guys at Scala they they said it's not HTML5's fault. It's Facebook's fault, and they created Facebook in HTML5. And they called it Facebook, and it is so much better. It actually still performs their native app. Sucks for them. Yeah. So, uh, but you should check it out. You can actually download it and view a web app of Facebook that's done right. So, so it was called Facebook. Yeah. I think wow. it, I think it wants to get anywhere. It does in that site. Say again. Plug it once, plug it anywhere. In that site. It's in that site. It's. I think the site actually is HTML5. Is, is HTML5 ready? So if you just search Facebook on Google, it should pull it up. Okay. Well, you put up the slide uh, showing the performance of some of the graphics chips out there. Mm -hmm. Um, if somebody has something like a, a MacBook Air, which has the HD 4000 in it, how does that, you know, how is that in terms of, you know, the you same know, sort of thing? That, that's great, because the great thing about Macs is that you can actually go to the Mac store and use their computers for testing, because they're all online, and I, you can download Chrome on them without them looking and do testing with that as well. Uh, that's how I got all those specs. Um, <laughs> And the old. Uh, Here he comes again, man. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> Just full screen. He came out. Just full screen. Uh, it's that little kid, he ran away. <laughs> so I have a lot of details for Macs. I don't have them for PCs because I can't go test them all. But uh, the old MacBook Airs have problems. They they did not work too well. The you know I'm really I have not had my hands on the new H uh, the new Intel embedded stuff. I, you know, same thing that the Microsoft Surface Pros are using, right? Right. And I've been asking the Microsoft guy, he's like, I don't have my Surface yet, so I can't give you a Surface. So I'm yeah. like, well, whenever you give me a Surface Pro, I want to test it. I want to do these same tests on it. This anecdote data, I've seen some people talk about the performance of them, and it seems to be pretty good. It seems like Intel has really made some good improvements on their embedded graphics. They're able to actually run some real 3D games on their new Surface Pro. Anybody got an idea that you try that? So. So anyway, but you can test that out. I think it'll. I think that that is pretty good. They're coming along with that. So I'm hoping that works, but I don't really know for sure. I haven't been able to test it. So there's some tests on that. So WebGL libraries. The top one I would suggest is a uh, 3JS. Uh, Mr. Do, the guy from Spain, wrote it. It's become insanely popular. Google uses it. Disney uses it. It's an open source project. If you're going to do 3D graphics probably use it. Everything I showed you is all hidden, so all you have to do is just say, create object, attach to scene, draw, right? So you can do pretty amazing stuff very simply with 3JS. Uh, GL, uh, GLGE, Copper Lake, Cubic VR, there's so many more that are out there. Um, I'd still say the most widely used and developed and supported is going to be 3JS. That's what I would suggest. Uh, tidbits, the debug context. There is a debug context that you can get from the uh, for the WebGL, and it'll call a debug test, say, was there an error, was there an error on web, every WebGL call you do. It is not good for release because it's making extra calls and everything, so you don't want to use that before debugging can be useful. Uh, WebGL Inspector is awesome. You can actually use that as a plugin for Chrome, and it will capture all the data sent to the GPU, so all the buffers, all the matrices, all the uniforms, give you a screenshot of every draw call, of what it did on the scene. You can pause it, look back at it, go look at all the textures loaded. You know, tools are amazing, but that brings up the other side of it. Your code is not protected. It's not, it's, right. it's JavaScript, it is not protected. Right. I can do a pause, 
on this thing and grab your shader code, your JavaScript code, there's nothing you can protect. That's why it's pretty amazing to me that Unreal Engine is going to port their engine over. It's because as soon as they do, they're going to minimize and obfuscate and all that stuff, but there are people out there who have nothing better to do, I guess. They right, go figure out how to get that. And right. they will, they, you can reverse engineer that code. So you can try to protect it, but it is still not, you can't encrypt it, you can't do anything, it's still got to be interpreted by the browser. So we make great tools to help us develop those are also great tools to hack sites with, right? right. So same thing. Use request animation frame. Uh, Twitter is good for this topic. Uh, a lot of guys I follow are just WebGL guys. Uh, some of them just JavaScript in general. But Mr. Do, uh, some of the, uh, well, everything I showed you except his stuff is, is all me. So, but if you have questions of WebGL, Twitter is a great resource. They're usually pretty responsive to get back to you. So if you look at the people I follow, most of them you can see. Who they are. Uh, if you want to get started quick, use 3JS or go to learningwebgl.com and it'll get you. So if you're trying to roll your own, go to learningwebgl. If you're like, I don't really want to roll my own, I just want to get something on the screen, 3JS. There's plenty of tutorial demos, all that stuff out there. Uh, pretty amazing. All right, so that's me. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Need the help. <laughs> uh, my website, all my stuff is open sourced. Everything I put up here, you can go to my Git, download it. Uh, I have a Everything blog.wiki.com. So check me that out there. Any questions? Well, I mean, the general one, it seems like 3D CSS is, is because a lot of the designers and other people are going to be familiar with CSS. Uh, that seems like it may have a head up. <coughs> it, it does, but it has a limitation. The issue is that I think when I was looking at people that were doing tests, they could get like 150 divs on the screen. And remember that each div is basically right. uh, two triangles. Right. right. So if you're going to try to do a complex scene, you can't do as much as you can do in WebGL. Gotcha. Now, if you're wanting to have some really cool, fluid UI experience, it's flipping stuff around, scaling right. it, yes, you want to go 3D CSS. Right. right. The, the magic of that makes it, I, I, that I really like WebGL for is the fact that all your GUIs, all your HUD elements, everything you do can all be done in HTML. You can use the same CSS and it's just laid right on top of it. And so you can still use all of that stuff, and your designers can really make stuff look nice, smooth, and fluid, and then have somebody else in the background doing the physics and AI for the 3D world. So since the data could be repurposed, really, if you were going to develop, you'd want to make um, a 3D CSS as part of your development so that as WebGL continues to improve, you can migrate with the marketplace. Sure. Right? Sure. Yeah. Valid. You probably don't want you, you want to have it's the same idea as that you know a mobile site is not a shrunk down desktop site, right? right. So a 3D CSS site is not going to be the same WebGL site, but you can right. definitely take a lot of features and change them up to get the same information and data there. You, know, you can explore that. user experience yes. options with 3, 3D CSS. And then as you become more savvy and as the marketplace and technology allows for it, you yes. pour it over to WebGL. Right, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And like I said, the, the famous FAMO.US, they're the ones that are really pushing it, but it's, like I said, it's funny because that's been out for a while. They're just the first people to market it. 3JS has a built-in 3D CSS stuff, so it'll automatically do it for you, too. So that's why I really like it. It has a 2D canvas backup, has 3D CSS in it, and WebGL, it's all the same. Code. So you write the code in 3JS and it works on everything. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty nice. Cool. Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> is there a responsive web, web design or graceful degradation type of concept that applies to WebGL? Yeah, that's what like 3JS does. Now, so and, and you say responsive or uh, graceful, it depends on what you're talking about. If you're saying that it tests to see if WebGL is there, and if it's not, then it can fall back to a 2D canvas mode, and it basically does the 3D on the CPU side and draws it on the canvas. And that's possible, but you have to be careful with that, right? Because it won't support complex stuff. But it will have a fallback for you. So that's there. But as far as responsive design, as far as changing the screen widths and things like that, that's the exact same thing as what you'd have before. You would test the width and height, the media queries, and then based upon what your screen size is, you set the width and height, set your proper projection matrix, it all works. Right? So this is what you're teaching at your university? Uh, yeah. 
I teach 3D graphics at it, but it's not web-based. I teach uh, DirectX there, so that's part of what I teach. I teach AI, I teach physics, I teach engine design, I teach, it's all C++ based. So we do simulation work. I do a lot of simulation work for like Baylor hospitals and things like that. You know, not just the idea of taking gaming technology into the real world, but use it for the experience. Uh, that's that's kind of like I'm going to show you. Where is that? Where's your input? Uh, to Brian. Go to, this is one of our latest projects. This is the Express Care Unit at uh, Baylor Hospital in Irving. So this is, we're setting up the simulation now to start analyzing patient flows and things like that <coughs> at their hospital. So this is, you know, whenever you're trying to make business decisions, it's, it's really nice if you can visualize what's happening. So mm -hmm. we have, we're building technology to help them see patient backup loading. What can happen if I drop something in here, how will that change? Well, if I had a person here, it'll all be visually able. Well, you couldn't you also do simulations like, oh, we've got somebody with a bird flu that just came in and, and now contaminated. What does that do to our? Yeah, yeah, exactly. our, our, you know. And you know, taking it beyond that, we can go into things like uh, this. That would impact staffing too, right? Yes, definitely. Yeah, so here's a, a breast biopsy cancer model that I'm working with them on to help give patients a better sense of where are looking at projecting cancers inside of us. So you'll physically see the margins and everything. There's something, there's applications are not just games. This is something that's directly applicable. So this is actually a 3D scan of a real uh, excision. So, yeah, that's what I said. He keeps wanting me to come in and watch a preview. I'm like, no. <laughs> Just send me the OBJ file. I'm good. That's all I need to see. <laughs> you, know, you know, this is what Pixar originally did. There's a lot of medical stuff. Yeah, so there's a lot of applications. So that's gaming technology. And this stuff, you know, for them, uh, you were talking about the old technology. One of the reasons this has gone off so well is because they can go to anybody's office and say, oh, just go to this link, here it is. Right. And that has made all the difference in the world for them. Sure. And that's huge. With the pads, especially people that aren't really big into computers, you know, a lot of them are more into biology, not uh, hardware. Right? Mm -hmm. So to give them a tablet that they can touch and move around in and really use their hands for, that's a lot of different experience. And that is getting people a lot more into this. So you can literally say, grab it, turn it around with your hand. Mm -hmm. right. This is what we're looking at. Yeah. So yeah. actually, this, like, this thing, uh, actually, you said pad? This is in like a... iPad. iPad. There are actually, there's a, a pretty neat project called uh, Ejecta, I want to say is what it's called. And what they've done is actually taken the WebGL context and wrapped it and made a native app that takes the WebGL calls and turns them into OpenGL calls. So you can take a WebGL app and get uh, native performance with it on iOS devices. So you can write it for web, use Ejecta as your engine. It basically just creates, like PhoneGap, creates a web view, right? right? It's it and then it's, yeah. but it's better than PhoneGap because of the fact that it's, it's true, it is native, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas PhoneGap is still running on a web view. This is actually creating, sorry, it doesn't create a web view, it actually creates an OpenGL object and translates those WebGL calls to native OpenGL calls, so you get true high performance with it. Well, PhoneGap they call that hybrid apps. What is that? What is, what would that be called? That's it's a native app. It's just that's all it is. You really are transforming it to a native app. Yes, because the calls are so similar. I mean, literally, if you know it, you name your variables right. It is just the exact same call with a dot. And so it, it just wraps them and calls the OpenGL stuff. So all your logic's still in JavaScript kicking in the background, but it's calling and drawing in OpenGL natively. And so it's high performance. So in that case, you have to find it for a particular hybrid platform? Well, that, that Electra is only for iOS at the moment. So it's... Well, even within iOS, there's probably different hardware specs. Well, I mean... You're probably not going to change anything as far as the calculations go. The only thing that's going to change is your width and your height for your 
projection matrix. Right. So you probably just will set that as set landscape, just like you do on the web. You grab width, grab height. And then well, but uh, you know, uh, is this a separate GPU code or not? And that's you could try to do that, but it's not required. I mean, you could try to optimize for different platforms and cut off some of the ideas of some of the extra coding you're doing. And so, I mean, that's, yeah, uh, you do the test, but you don't have to. Uh, so this is a, so this is the lighting, just to kind of give you an idea. So just by changing, this is changing a variable inside of the shader. So it looks more like satin there. It looks more like plastic there, just by changing that one variable. Uh, right. So that's just changing a uniform. Yes, sir. What what would be the benefit of using WebGL over just writing OpenGL code if you're going to write a native application that's going to be a game? Install base. I don't have to install it. I can just send people a link. I, they always get the current version that's downloaded. I mean, all the same benefits you get for web apps, right? Mm -hmm. So if you that, that's really it. Is there in this question I have obviously. A, there's a lot of it's going to be in the textures of what gets applied. And there can be a bit of size there, can't there, as yes. far as the images that are going to be used for texturing? Right. What, what would be the approach to help minimize that? They actually have compressed textures for OpenGL and binary data sending for streaming in data. So that you can actually have extremely large texture packs, and they're strung over an extremely compact size. So and that's optimized on the back end through OpenGL, through the GPU itself. So that's what we we're doing to minimize. I'm not doing any of that at the moment. I'm just, I'm not really worried about my download times at this point because it's, it's an app that is set for certain people. But you can actually look at compressed textures, and that's the solution. And it's a dramatic difference. So I think y'all were talking about the mini uh, teams. Mini here. JPEG. Yeah, that is, it's that same sort of concept, but it's actually just this huge compression algorithm that they're doing. The, the one advantage I can see is, is firewalls with corporate. Oh yeah, right. Because if this, if it's native HTML, and and uh, your IT department, it's cool. the web, man. And, and you know, and they are really, really restricting what employees can download and and put on, especially secure, right? Companies. Mm -hmm. So this allows you to disseminate that stuff to well, people beyond their firewall. And that's that's just web apps in general, though, right? I mean, right. That's, that's the use of web apps. So I mean, literally, I, I didn't show it in a second demo I have, that's a co-op, one person's a gunner on a tank, other person's flying around, and you can play it across the internet anywhere, it's on port 80, web sockets, you can run it on any system anywhere, right? There's no install, it just runs. And that is the huge difference, right? Yes. Okay, so you mentioned uh, running the Chrome IE Firefox and Safari, all these browsers. So it's working as a web app in the browser, but not using uses the canvas. It uses the canvas. So everything you demonstrate uses the canvas. Yes. WebGL is a canvas that you just get the 3D context to rather than the 2D context. Right. Is, is WebGL a true wrapper? Yes. Uh, so everything we do with OpenGL, we can do. OpenGL ES 2.0, right, which is like seven-year-old technology, right? Now, there, I think there are a few things that were not implemented, but the majority of it, yes, it was. they wrap almost everything. So it's truly, I mean, you can do a lot of stuff. And with, have y'all heard of MN scripting, you know, the uh, tool that will take C++ and port it over to JavaScript. So that's, uh, it's pretty impressive with what they, especially with ASMJS, they're getting, you know, just a uh, two times performance hit. So, I mean, they're getting close to native speeds now with that tool. And that's, you know, we start thinking about, I can take a large C++ code base, and I don't have to do anything except, say, convert and it gets me almost native speeds in JavaScript, that's impressive. That is impressive. JavaScript's taking over the world, man. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, you know, that's, that's where I would go. AS, that would be like, next thing I'd like to talk about is ASMJS. That's going to change things. You can actually see it now. Yeah, so. Well, as mobile becomes the, 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 the focal point of commerce with regard to companies, and you're going to see more and more development in that direction. Rock on, dude. Any other questions? Thank you, Kurt.